My name is Amata and in this Red Gaming Tech video I am here with a smattering of tech news from the past 24 hours or so. Now, what do I have for you today? Well, I've got something from NVIDIA with GeForce Now Game Streaming, Toshiba are considering an IPO, and AMD have revealed the specs of a AMD Ryzen Raven Ridge desktop. Yes, desktop APU. Now, of course, I'm going to leave the juiciest to last, because that's just how I roll. Haha, <laughs> evil laugh. Anyway, let's begin things with... GeForce Now. Now of course GeForce Now has been around for quite a while as of course it did begin life as a paid surface for their TV console The Shield and of course if you do own a Shield, all five of you, you can pay $8 a month to stream Nvidia's collection of games to your device. However, CES was of course home to a bundle of announcements but CES last year Nvidia did announce that GeForce Now was making its way to Mac and PC. So, you might wonder, okay, that's CES 2017, why are you talking about that? This is like older than old. Well, it's finally now available in beta, as of course, they did initially announce a release date of March 2017 to get this service up and running on Mac and PC. Unfortunately, there's no pricing available at the moment. It is free for the duration of the beta, so if you want to go give it a look-see, you can sign up, but unfortunately there is a waiting list, as you might expect. So you can kind of get a little preview of what's coming, but unfortunately we don't know exactly how expensive it's going to be. Now, they did say it was going to cost more than the $8 it cost in the Shield, however, there is of course an important caveat in that you can basically run any game you like on it rather than the games that Nvidia have approved. So we'll have to see as to the value for money. I think that's going to be the most important thing as well as of course the usual questions when it comes to these sort of services of latency and input lag and that sort of thing. I mean I doubt I doubt you could play a fighting game on this thing, but to be honest I don't think you'd really expect to. So whether or not the games that are on it are actually going to be playable, you know, how much is it going to be punished by a bad internet, you know, how good does your internet have to be, that sort of thing. But those, some of those questions, of course, will be answered in the beta, but unfortunately the pricing value for money, we're going to have to wait and see. So let's move swiftly on from that topic to Toshiba. Now for those of you who keep your ears to the ground when it comes to all things corporate, you may recall that Toshiba did agree to sell Toshiba Memory, who are of course the second, second biggest, excuse me, <laughs> producer of NAND chips to a consortium which are being led by Bain Capital, which is basically an aid of covering billions of dollars in liabilities, and yeah, I just things weren't going all that well for them basically, but they have now an interesting consideration to make as they no longer face the pressure it one did to complete a sale after raising $5.4 billion with a new share issue to overseas funds late last year and various tax write-offs, yada yada yada. So you might say, okay, what are they going to do then? They've already made the deal. Well, if the sale, which was $18 billion, by the way, to Bain Capital fails to gain antitrust approval by the end of March, they are going to be considering an IPO of its prize memory chip business. Now, this is obviously one of the various contingency plans being considered by the top brass over at Toshiba, but according to some sources, the shareholders at Toshiba do favour it over the existing deal. Now you might wonder what's an IPO and it is actually a initial public offering and it basically means that the stock is going to be made available to the public. It means people who haven't been there since year dot can actually invest in the company. Given the shaky ground that they've been on it might not be you know, the wisest of ideas but I'm, I'm far from an investment expert so you know I should, I should probably hush my mouth to be honest but that is what they're doing. They're basically hoping, crossing their fingers that the agreed to plan falls through so they can actually do an IPO now they don't feel so backed into a corner to actually accept this deal with Bain. So of course we're going to have to wait and see what happens. It's going to be March as I said that is going to be the final tell as to what's going to happen with Toshiba but if it all goes as they plan then yeah you could technically buy some stocks from Toshiba if you've got the scratch kicking around. However let us go on to the main course of this particular video. And that is of course Raven Ridge, or to be more specific, the Ryzen 2000G Raven Ridge APU. 
Now, of course, we've heard quite a bit about the mobile variations of Raven Ridge. We've had quite a few spec sheets, performance benchmarks, that sort of thing. A decent look of what's going on in that APU on the mobile side. But today, AMD have revealed the specs of the first desktop socket, AMD a AM4, excuse me, APUs based on the Raven Ridge series. And this is, as I said, the Ryzen 2000G. So you might go, oh, specs, let me see, let me see. Well, you can actually see on screen right about now. But audio, oh, audio only, yes, I can say words, audio only listeners, have no fear. I'm going to go through them for you. So basically, it is a quad-core Zen CPU with an integrated graphics core, which, as you might expect, is based upon Vega with 11 NGCUs, which brings us a total of 704 stream processors. And there are initially bringing to the fore two SKUs, the Ryzen 3 2200G and the Ryzen 5 2400G. Now, other than clock speeds, which obviously is the main differentiator there, they are also made different by the fact that Ryzen 5 not only has more iGPU stream processors, but also has CPU SMT. However, there's also a difference in price, as you might expect. Ryzen 5 is 169 US dollars, whereas Ryzen 3 goes for 99. And both of these are actually going to be made available, made available sooner than you might expect on the 12th of February 2018. But let's talk a bit more in detail about each of these variants that we have on offer here. Now, we already know, as I said, that it is a quad-core Zen CPU. But, you know, might go, okay, what's the thread count? Well, for Ryzen 5, again, that's a 2400, it has a 4-core 8-thread CPU with a clock speed of 3.6 gigahertz with a boost of 3.9. Not too shabby at all. And it also has 12 megabytes of L2 cache, which, for you back-of-the-napkin maths guys over there, is 512 kilobytes per core, and 4 megs of shared L3 cache. I've already mentioned about you know the fact that it uses Vega 11 and the stream process and all that, so I don't need to go through that again. However, the iGPU engine clock, which of course I did emphasize earlier, is set to 1250 megahertz. Also has a dual channel DDR4 integrated memory controller support, of course, up to 64 gigabytes. So you can sport up to 64 gigs of dual channel DDR4 2933 megahertz memory. So, as you might expect, the Ryzen 3 is its slightly cut-down brother. It lacks SMT, as I already said. It is, instead of being 8 threads, it is only 4, so it's 4 core, 4 thread. And, of course, as you might expect, has lower base and boost clocks with 3.5 base and 3.7 boost, respectively. However, the cache hierarchy for the CPU is unchanged. However, we only have 8 out of 11, 11 NGCUs which of course brings us to 512 stream processors. Also, as you might also expect, we do see a lower clock speed for the iGPU engine clock. Now, you do have unlocked CPU base clock multipliers, and both of them have a pretty low TDP of 65 watts, and also feature some cooling solutions from AMD Wraith Stealth. So, some interesting stuff to say the least and gives you a pretty nice idea I'd say of what kind of performance you can expect from these APUs. And obviously these are extremely cheap, especially Ryzen 3, that's insanely cheap, especially given the performance. But obviously it is integrated graphics, which obviously is always a bit more limited than your desktop graphics card, whatever that graphics card happened to be, you know, it could be a 1070, 1080 Ti, whatever. When you're talking integrated, it is obviously going to be less powerful than a desktop graphics card, unless that desktop graphics card is literally the first one ever made or something, you know. Barring ridiculous comparisons like that, most of the time, obviously, integrated graphics just isn't as good as desktop. So, obviously, keep that in mind. But as a, you know, the CPU side is really, really good, obviously... I really want to see some benchmarks for this thing, not only in terms of like how it does as a CPU, but of course gaming. That's the real question here is can you buy this as an insanely cheap gaming solution? And you probably can, to be honest, but obviously the question is what kind of performance are you going to get out of it? What kind of resolutions can you play at? You know, what kind of graphic settings are we talking about here? Obviously we're not going to be getting this at 4K max on Crisis 3 anytime soon, but 
I'll be interested to see exactly what kind of power we can rinse out of this baby. So hopefully we'll be seeing some performance numbers soon. But at least we have the specs. That's always a good start. As always, guys, thank you very much for your support. It is always appreciated by both myself and Paul, who, of course, is still away in Norway having a well-deserved holiday. So thanks again for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.